Okay, we'll start with this. It would seem that the prediction stuck and Eric Cruz has managed to unseat Meyerlene Rivas as WBA Super Bantamweight Champion, oh. albeit tenuously. Let's just talk about what we saw. At the start of this match, it was difficult for Erica to keep up with and keep on Meyerlene Rivas, who was moving around and creating space the way I expected her to, the way I said she would, right. using the ring and trying to set up counters as Erica stalked her. And those early rounds, at least for me, were difficult rounds to score because while Meyerlene is making Erica miss all of her punches and moving around. She's not landing very many, if any, punches herself. So who do you give the round to? Do you give it to Erica Cruz for pushing the pace and the intent? Or do you give it to Mayerlene Rivas for making Erica miss so many punches but not landing very many, if any, herself? Those early rounds really were hard to score, though. In the middle and towards the end, Erica Cruz started finding a range, landing punches, and continually applying pressure. That was the prevailing aesthetic of this match. Erica Cruz was the aggressor, and Mayerlene Rivas was very much the defender, who didn't want to spend a lot of time trading punches, didn't want to sit in the pocket with Erica, and could hold the center of the ring. Which, when scoring a fight, always stands out to me. The fighter that's moving around, the fighter that's got to give up ground, has their back on the ropes. Unless that fighter is landing clean, clear, hard counters consistently, they're losing the round. Because when has having your back on the ropes ever been the year mark of a boxer winning the round? If your back is on the ropes, it's primarily because someone is putting you there. And unless you're landing clean, clear, hard shots, to offset that, you're losing. You're losing the round. And for me and my money, in the middle and towards the end, even though the exchanges were very scrappy and the exchanges were messy with Erica and Meyerlene, it was Erica initiating those exchanges and it was Erica getting the better end of them. Even if occasionally Meyerlene was able to catch her with one or two shots in between the punches, Erica was getting off and she was getting off more often than Meyerlene, whereas Meyerlene was mostly retreating. Meyerlene's style is more conventional, more textbook. She's a more textbook boxer, whereas Erica Cruz is more awkward, more scrappy. Like what you see from some other pressure fighters in Jessica McCaskill and Emmanuel Navarrete, Erica Cruz's style, it's awkward and it's messy, but it works. And not everyone has what it takes to work around it. Meyerlene Rivas simply beating those feet and moving around the ring, for me, was not enough for her to keep the WBA title, and she didn't. I said it ahead of the fight. She was struggling with one pressure fighter in Nazarena Romero in the fight before this one, and she would struggle with Erica Cruz, who's an even more experienced pressure fighter than Nazarena is. And a lot more awkward. Erica Cruz barrels forward, bobbing and weaving and fighting at a slight crouch, bringing over big looping punches, looping shots from out of the southpaw stance, throwing punches from unconventional angles. Can be hard to defend against her if you don't have the firepower to back her off and back her out. What most conventional boxers will elect to do with a fighter like Erica Cruz is stay out of the pocket, move around, try to create some space, land some counters. Everything you saw Mayerlene Rivas tried to do that saw her coming up short because she just wasn't getting enough done. She herself took to her social media after the fight saying they may have robbed her of her WBA title, but they didn't rob her of her talent, so she will return. And there are three other champions at this weight she can challenge to see herself become a champion again. There's Ellie Scottney holding the IBF, Yemi Mercado holding the WBC, and Sigoline Lafarve of La France holding the WBO. Maybe she can fight one of them. She mentioned wanting to run it back with Erica Cruz, wanting a rematch, but I get the sense that what Matchroom would like to do moving forward is stage a fight between two of their champions, Erica Cruz, newly crowned WBA champion, and Ellie Scottney for what are the WBA and IBF titles immediately after the fight, 
Ali Scottney expressed her desire to share the ring with Erica Cruz. That's not going to be an easy fight, and we'll give that a first look in another video. In the end, the prediction stuck, and Erica Cruz was able to unseat Mayerling Rivas as WBA champion the way I said she would. She's got her flaws, she's got her drawbacks, but she is a handful, and you need certain ingredients to weather the storm from Erica Cruz. Congratulations to her. Now on the main event of that same card, we saw unbeaten up-and-comer Diego Pacheco take on crafty veteran Marcelo Coceres. Marcelo, who's developed a reputation over time for being a hard day's work, a hard night at the office. He made Billy Joe Saunders look bad back when Billy was still WBO champion at this weight, and he made Edgar Berlanga look bad. Many would say that he was the first to expose Edgar Berlanga, the way he was moving lateral and making Edgar follow him in straight lines, walking Edgar into punches. He actually scored a knockdown over Edgar in that fight. In this fight, he didn't have that same luck. Diego Pacheco was effectively able to weather him and break him down. At the start, you saw it was a little hard for Diego to get his range down and land clean punches on Marcelo Coceres. At the start, it was Marcelo landing eye-catching shots, eye-catching left hooks. Photo finish left hooks. He was cracking Diego Pacheco upside the head with those left hands. Though eventually, the very statuesque Diego Pacheco, a noticeably long and limber super middleweight, eventually he was able to figure him out. I want to say that Diego exhibits better range control than most long and limber fighters do today. You got these fighters that they're very tall for their divisions, very tall for their weight, like Brandon Figueroa at featherweight, Sebastian Fundora at junior middle, and Diego Pacheco at super middle. What we see with some of these other tall, long, and rangy fighters is they don't use their height, their extremities, as well as Diego Pacheco does. They don't exhibit the same range control. What you see from Brandon is what you see from Sebastian. These are very tall fighters that give up their height to their opponents to trade punches in the pocket. They're not very good from the outside. They favor the inside. I've always interpreted this as tall fighters that are not necessarily good long range fighters. Whereas with Diego, we see great range control, great straight punches from the outside coming in and great bent arm punches on the inside in the phone booth. What happens with some of these tall fighters is they're not comfortable managing the distance. So what they end up doing is giving up their height and their reach to their opponents to box mid-range to inside where they can smother them. Them being so uncomfortable boxing from the outside. You see that with Brandon Figueroa. You see that with Sebastian Fundora. But you don't see that with Diego Pacheco. Diego Pacheco can box from the outside or bang on the inside. His shot selection is noteworthy as well. He can shorten up the punches in close quarters, get off hooks, get off uppercuts. It was actually an uppercut that sent Marcelo Coceres careening into the ropes before the fight got waved off. For a guy with long arms, that's impressive. Being able to get off those good, hard, straight punches and those short, bent arm punches in the pocket. Diego is versatile and he's got star quality star power this kid's a winner and it's matchroom's intention the following year to get him out there at least three times three times next year base him out of the west coast where he's from so he can develop a following develop more marquee value immediately after the fight you saw another unbeaten up-and-comer in the super middleweight division, another matchroom fighter like Diego Pacheco and Edgar Berlanga say that he wished Marcelo Coceres would have fought him the way he was fighting Diego because it seems like Marcelo took more chances with Diego than he did with Edgar. And what it really was is that those two fighters, Diego and Edgar, they're built different. Edgar is a more compact super middleweight, more muscular, whereas Diego, he's a taller, longer guy. If it looked like Marcelo was coming forward a bit more on Diego, it's because he didn't have a choice. He couldn't box him from the outside the way he did Edgar. On the outside with Diego, he would have been a sitting duck. So what you saw from Marcelo in this fight that you didn't see in the Berlanga fight was he was coming forward more, mixing it up on the inside more. That was due to Diego's extremities, his height, his length, you can't box him from the outside. He'll pick you apart, whereas Edgar, you can box Edgar on the outside because he's got slow feet, limited shot selection. A noticeable difference. I think Pacheco versus Berlanga is the fight to make 
for Matchroom. I think it's time for Edgar Berlanga to shit a get off the pot. If you want to get big money and you want to be in big fights, well, now's the time. You have to take risks. And I would favor Diego Pacheco to beat Edgar Berlanga. I think he's just a better fighter, better overall than Edgar Berlanga. And he hasn't spent as much time experimenting with his corner than Edgar has. I think in the last two to three years, Edgar's had two to three trainers. Caught between styles. They brought him up and build him as a knockout merchant, a knockout puncher, whereas these days, he seems to want to play the boxer more and more. And his knockout streak has ended. Instead of focusing on what it was Marcelo Coceres decided to do with you that he didn't do with Diego or vice versa, why don't you just call Diego out? Why don't you just set it up? You're on the same platform, you fight under the same banner, you're on the same side of the street, and you want to be in a meaningful fight, right? Right. Don't wait till Diego develops more and more. He's only going to be more dangerous later on. If you stand any chance of winning, now would be the time to do the fight while he's still green. Though even now I would pick Diego to beat him. I think Diego, he's just a better fighter, better all around, with a higher ceiling. It's been five years. It's been five years since Matchroom first signed this kid, and he's looking promising. He's looking world class and really coming into his own. Congratulations to him on another highlight reel knockout. Elsewhere in the men's super middleweight division, as it pertains to the upcoming Benavidez versus Andre fight, Eddie Hearn expects Benavidez to stop Andre. I think Canelo at that point will take the fight. Canelo is running out of opponent options at super middleweight. When you look at Canelo, you've now got to look at where the real challenges are coming from, right? Hearn told FightHype.com. Benavidez against Andre, good fight. I expect Benavidez to stop Demetrius Andre, and when he does, I think he's going to make a real claim to fight Canelo Alvarez, and I think Canelo at that point will take the fight. I think it will be that big that he will take it, and I don't think he's afraid of David Benavidez. Canelo isn't afraid of anyone, and he will fight everybody. The deal has got to be right, of course, but he'll still fight them. You think about the PBC, what they've got going on right now, that they don't have a broadcast partner, and if they do, a new one, they haven't announced it yet, and that they're supposed to have two fights remaining in the existing deal with Canelo Alvarez. How does that work out now that they're not with Showtime anymore? How can they get Canelo Alvarez his guaranteed cash moving forward? What assurances can they provide Canelo Alvarez that they can still honor the deal as it is when they don't have Showtime backing them anymore. Eddie Hearn continued, too many people are too passive and disappointing against Canelo Alvarez, Hearn said, you know, and they're kind of like, look at Charlo. It was almost like, you know, I was going to say disgraceful, but I feel that's disrespectful to a fighter. But it was like you're getting whatever he got, 8 million, 10 million. You didn't really try and win the fight, did you? You know, so you need young, hungry fighters that are gonna go in and that's why I look at it I think Caleb Plant did really well I thought Billy Joe Saunders did well like these are guys that didn't really show any respect or fear you know what Eddie Hearn is referring to is how Jermel Charlo spent all those years spent all that time calling out Canelo Alvarez so that when he finally gets the fight and he finally gets the opportunity all he does is goes out there and survives tries to survive, giving off the impression that the only real reason you wanted to fight Canelo was for the check. You didn't actually think you could win or try to win when you got the fight. You want to see Canelo against guys that are hungry, guys that are going to try. And I feel like David Benavidez is one of those guys, and I think Crawford would be another one of those guys. Crawford's a winner. Crawford would do everything to try and win that fight. He'd take chances, but I think he's too small, and I think you're going to get beat. Crawford's only going to get beat by being too small. And I think against Canelo Alvarez, you're not talking about two divisions like Charlo. You're talking about three divisions. And as good as he is, and as good as his movement is, I don't think he beats Canelo Alvarez. That's how Eddie Hearn sees it. He thinks David Benavidez is going to beat Demetrius Andre, and when he does, it'll be down to Canelo versus Benavidez. He doesn't like Demetrius's chances, even though he used to promote him. Demetrius himself says, I can hit Benavidez with shots where I can probably put him out. Previous videos I've talked about how 
David Benavidez doesn't seem to fight very many, if any, southpaws. I can't remember the last time that he fought one. And that's what Demetrius is. He's a southpaw. He's a former Olympian. I definitely feel I can hit him with shots where, you know, I can probably put him out, for sure, Andre said. And it will do damage. And I think he will be surprised on the type of power, the movement I have, where he would want to take his time more, and it could go the distance, you know? He's a big kid. He's a big kid. So I know I have to wear him down. Have to wear him down. Don't underestimate the importance of the angle of attack. Demetrius Andre being a southpaw and David Benavidez not having that much experience with southpaws. Demetrius Andre has a penchant for coming out hard and fast and even scoring a knockdown in the early goings of a match. I'd wager if he does that with David, he might elicit more respect out of him. Show him that you're not just going to walk me down the way you did Caleb. That's what's worth working for him. What's working against him is that he's 35 going on 36 years old. And while he may have a penchant for starting out strong, he does fade down the stretch. So you might amass an early lead, but can you keep it? It's easier said than done, but I know I've been doing this for a long time as well, Andre said. I've been a professional for 15 years now, haven't been hurt, haven't been hurt like bad, haven't been down, you know? You can never really go to a fight and say, Demetrius Andre's been hit hard and down and he's all over the place, so I'm fresh. I don't think that Demetrius Andre, throughout the 15 years of his pro boxing career, has sustained much damage, but he has been down. He got sat on his ass at 154, and he got sat on his ass earlier this year at 168 in the Desmond Nicholson fight. So he has been down. Will David Benavidez get him out, though? Eddie Hearn thinks he will, myself. I'm not so sure. I could see David winning a points decision. I could see Demetrius getting off to a decent start the same way that Caleb Plant did. I could see Demetrius troubling David Benavidez for a few rounds fighting out of the southpaw stance, and then I could see the pace catching up to Demetrius, who's in his mid-30s. I could then see David Benavidez taking over because he's got a great engine. He does have great energy reserves, and I could see David winning a points decision. I mean, David, he couldn't knock out an exhausted Caleb Plant. So I don't know that he knocks out Demetrius Andre, but I do think he can outwork him down the stretch. I think he can win a points decision. I'd be impressed if he actually knocks him out. I'd give him credit for it. I'm just not sure that's how it ends. David Benavidez, by hook or by crook, winning a points decision seems the logical choice to me because they've got far too much riding on David Benavidez and Canelo Alvarez. Making that fight what would be a big money fight, they're not going to let Demetrius Andre spoil those plans. Short of a knockout, Demetrius don't win this thing. They won't let him win a points decision, and he himself, he's not a knockout merchant. He never was.